Okay, we've got Tim Sarong is up next. Thank you. Thank you, um, as Simon said, my name's Tim, and I'm here to present to you a gentle introduction to Seth. Uh, I'm probably contractually obligated to point out that if you would like a nice green SUSE supported Ceph, the one you want is SUSE Enterprise Storage. And now that I've gotten that out of the way, once upon a t hey, <laughs> okay, seriously, once upon a time there was a free and open source distributed storage solution named Ceph. Ceph has been around for a while. The first stable release was in July 2012. My slides are broken, or the video output is. Um, there's lots of goodies inside, distributed object storage, redundancy, efficient scale out, you can build it on commodity hardware. It's the most popular choice of distributed storage for OpenStack. You can check out the user survey where they say that. And Ceph. This is going to be really annoying. Ceph gives us a storage cluster which is self-healing and self-managed. That's not to say that you don't need to keep an eye on it, but if something breaks, um, if a node goes down, Ceph will notice and it will start replicating your data somewhere else in the background so that it's always stored redundantly. And there's no bottlenecks. There's three interfaces to a Ceph cluster for talking to your data. You get object access like Amazon S3, uh, block access or a distributed file system called CephFS. Architecturally, it looks like this. Uh, at the bottom, you've got RADOS, Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Store, that's the cluster. And on top of that, you've got RADOS Gateway, which you can talk to via S3 or Swift APIs, um, RBD for RADOS block devices, they're thin provision, they support snapshots, they're huge. Uh, you can mount them with Linux kernel drivers or user space stuff. Uh, one of my colleagues at SUSE created a thing called LRBD, so you can export these as iSCSI targets as well if you've got Windows or other clients. And there's the CephFS file system. Back to our narrative. Sysadmins throughout the land needed to know the components that made up Ceph. And they are at the lowest level, you've got a physical disk. Um, on top of that, there's a file system you don't see inside that, it's managed by Ceph. On top of that, there's an object storage daemon or OSD for short. OSDs serve stored objects to clients and they peer with each other behind the scenes to perform replication and recovery. So you put several OSDs in one node. It's just a, it's a Linux server with Ceph installed and a bunch of disks, a bunch of OSDs running. Build a bunch of them. And then you add a few... I'm really sorry about this. Then you add a few monitor nodes, um, or mons for short. Monitors are the brain cells of the cluster. They know who's in and who's out. They do membership. They have a consensus algorithm for distributed decision making. They don't serve stored objects to clients. They're the first point of contact for a client, um, but after that, the clients talk directly to the OSDs. And you get a small Ceph cluster. If you've got 17 storage nodes and three monitor nodes, you get a 20-node cluster that fits really neatly on one slide, and you can write to it. Client writes from a client will go to one OSD, which will then propagate the replica to the other OSDs behind the scenes. The write won't complete until all the replicas are written. This is Ceph making sure that your data really is stored redundantly before you get a write acknowledgement. And of course, you can read from the cluster because a write-only cluster would be funny but useless. Um, the clients can read from any OSD, so good um, aggregate throughput. Underlying this are three conceptual components, pools, placement groups, and crush. Pools are a logical container for storage objects, um, and they have a set of parameters. They have a name, which you care about. They have an ID that you don't care about, because that's internal to Rados. They have certain settings, a number of replicas, or erasure coding settings, which I'll talk about in a bit, a number of placement groups, crush rules, an owner, some other things, 
And within a pool, you can do certain things. You can create read and write objects. You can snapshot the pool, for example. Placement groups, you don't talk to directly, but you care how many of them there are, because they're hash buckets, effectively, that help balance data across uh, all the OSDs. Uh, it's too computationally intensive to maintain a mapping between um, every object and every OSD it might be on. So um, look up the object in the placement group. Placement group tells you which OSDs it's on. Typically, one placement group will span several OSDs, and one OSD typically serves many placement groups. This is a tunable. Um, read the documentation. You kind of want 50 to 100 per OSD. You can always increase this. You can't decrease it. So it's probably better to start with less than to start with more. Crush, controlled replication under scalable hashing. The mons maintain what's called the crush map, uh, but the default crush map just says there's a bunch of nodes or hosts, and all data shall be replicated such that it's on more than one host. But you can configure this to represent the physical topology of your data center. So you can say, here's my crush map. There's two rooms. There's rows in those rooms, racks in those rows, and so on. And you can configure your policy so that um, you've always got a replica on, in both rooms in case one of them catches fire and you know, you've got your data. The clients understand crush. And this is the magic that removes bottlenecks. Because once the clients have a copy of the crush map, they can figure out which OSDs to talk to. No bottlenecks. This is really annoying. Um, <clears throat> our mythical sysadmins wanted to deploy software-defined storage instead of legacy storage arrays. Legacy storage arrays have certain limits and benefits. They tend to be a tightly controlled environment with relatively limited scalability and not so many options. There's certain approved drives, constrained drive slots, fewer memory variations, um, networking choices, and so on. On the plus side, they're reasonably easy to understand. And collectively, we've got long experience with them. So our gut instincts are kind of you know, more or less right. And they're somewhat deterministic in behavior and pricing. Software-defined storage is software, so it has absolutely no limits at all, right? Um, it's infinitely scalable, infinitely adaptable. It gives you infinite choices, infinite flexibility. But you usually can't touch those infinities with your bare hands in manifest reality for some reason. So we start to care about the properties of software-defined storage systems. Things that we care about are throughput and latency and IOPS, capacity and density, availability, reliability, and of course, cost. These goals often conflict. My favorite silly availability versus density example is if you build a storage system uh, in one rack that's so dense that it weighs a million tons and your floor beams give way and all the network cables get ripped out the back, it's not very available anymore. Um, IOPS versus density, less dense, more spindles, more IOPS, everything versus cost. There's lots of hardware options. The software topology gives you many configuration choices. And there's no one size fits all. So they found they had many questions regarding configuration choices. For example, network. For Ceph, choose the fastest one that you can afford with fully meshed backplanes and all that networky goodness. Separate public and cluster networks. And you want your cluster network to have twice the public bandwidth because your clients will speak to the cluster on the public network. And the cluster network is used for replication, background scrubs, uh, peering, recovery, and so on. You can run this over anything that looks like IP, probably not carrier pigeon, but it needs to be faster than that. Um, 1 gig, 10 gig, 40 gig E. 4 10 gig E's bonded might be a good cost point. Um, IP over IB as well. Somebody's working on native RDMA support. I don't know where that's up to. Individual storage nodes. These are just, um, like I said, Linux boxes with disks in them. Um, you care about the CPU number and speed of cores. We tend to recommend 1.5 gigahertz of a CPU core per OSD. Memory, you want 1 or 2 gig per OSD or per terabyte of storage, depending on who you ask. Um, you had a node with eight disks in it, give it 16 gig of RAM. Storage controller, it's bandwidth, performance, and cache size. 
You might be interested in putting SSDs in front of spinning Rust OSDs to act as journals for them, which I'll talk about in a sec. And you care about how many disks you're putting in and their capacity and their performance. SSD journals accelerate bursts and random write I.O. So you can have an SSD in there with like four petitions on it, and they each act as journals for four separate OSDs. Uh, so we recommend everybody do this um, for that performance boost. Sustained writes that overflow, um, the journal will degrade to hard disk, by disk drive speeds necessarily. Uh, they don't help much with read performance. They're expensive, they consume storage slots, so you might not want to use them for those reasons. If you can't, you probably want a large battery back cache on the storage controller if you're not using SSDs. Hard disk parameters. Capacity matters. The highest density is not necessarily the most cost effective choice. The reliability advantage of enterprise drives is typically marginal compared to their cost because Ceph's replicating all your data anyway, so who cares if they break? Um, you might like high RPM drives for increased IOPS and throughput, but then you've got more power consumption and cost, so another choice. In terms of redundancy, there's a couple of things you can do. You can use replication which is basically like a RAID 1. You get a certain number of exact full-size copies of your data. This gives you, it's simple, um, it's fast. It gives you increased read performance through striping. The more replicas you configure, the lower throughput you'll have on writes because they've all got a complete um, increased cluster network utilization for writes because of that. Rebuild, on the other hand, rebuilds can leverage multiple sources, but on the third hand, there's a significant capacity impact because if you've got a replica level of three, um, one third of your disks are used for live data and the other two thirds are uh, redundant copies to be sure to be sure. Erasure coding is the other way. Um, if you haven't heard the term, I explain it as a, it's a general concept of which RAID 5 and RAID 6 are specific examples. In a 4 plus 1 RAID 5, you've got four data and one parity. Uh, in a 10 plus 2 RAID 6, you've got 10 data, two parity. Erasure coding lets you play with those numbers. So you could have a 7 plus 5 or, or whatever numbers you want, um, depending on how many failures you're prepared to tolerate. This gives you much better space efficiency than replication at the cost of a higher CPU overhead and uh, potentially significant CPU and cluster network impact during rebuild. And you can't use an EC pool directly with block devices. Happily, you can combine these together using cache tiering. So you can configure one replicated pool, do the whole thing on SSDs if you want, nice and fast, acting as a transparent write back overlay for another um, EC pool. You can flush from one to the other on relative or absolute dirty levels or age. There's some additional configuration complexity and um, you need to tune it for your workload. And there's some downsides, you can't snapshot those. But it's a really good way to combine the advantages of replication and erasure coding um, within the one cluster. If you add more nodes to a Ceph cluster, lots of nice things happen. The capacity increases, the total throughput and IOPS will increase, and of course the redundancy increases. The latency won't change. Eventually you'll run out of ports on your switch or you'll hit some other network topology limitation. And there's a temporary impact during rebalancing when you add a new node. Ceph always tries to keep all of your data evenly spread out across the cluster. Um, so if you've got this many nodes and you add this many more, this much data? Anyway, is going to come off those nodes and get spread out, okay, to the rebalancing when you add a new node. Adding more disks to a node is sort of similar. Um, again, the capacity increases and redundancy increases. Throughput and IOPS might increase, uh, but it will consume internal node bandwidth. There might be a higher CPU and memory load and cache contention, but it won't change the latency. So, please stop doing this. Yes. So, but learning which questions to ask enabled us to build sensible proofs of concept, which scaled up and out, leading to my last slide, how to size a Ceph cluster. Understand your workload, 
and then make a best guess based on the desirable properties of that workload, factors, space, how much you need physically and virtually cost, etc. And then build a 10% pilot or proof of concept, optimally using loaner hardware from a friendly vendor who knows that you're going to buy more later if it all works. And then refine that until you get something like the performance that you're after. And then just scale it up, just add more nodes. Because most of the characteristics of Ceph will be retained or even improved at scale. The other thing to mention is that this doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you can always evolve it later. You can wheel in newer, shinier, better nodes, shuffle the data off onto them, get rid of the crusty old nodes, um, and evolve from there. And they all lived happily ever after. Thank you. Um, questions, anybody? Paul, got, sorry, Paul looked first, I think. Um, one of the technologies that I've seen in disk storage is shingle write yep. technology. Is there any sort of indication in things like Seth of adapting their write patterns to take advantage or to work with shingle write? Um, the question was, is Seth doing anything to adapt their write patterns to work with shingled writes? Um, the answer is, I saw an email that indicated that somebody was looking at it somewhere. Not, it's, it, look, it, it, you know, people know that this is a thing that should be done, I just I don't know what state it's in. So. How does SEF go with small clusters? How does SEF go with small clusters? Um, how does SEF go with small clusters? Um, there's, a, there's a point... Um, who was I talking to? Somebody said, um, don't bother with Ceph. If you're, if you're building something that's physically smaller than this, right? <laughs> um, a, a traditional SAN is going to be just fine. Um, um, yeah, the, the smallest thing that we're willing to support is um, like four or five nodes or something at, at SUSE to try to move people. Like this is a hugely scalable thing, right? And it gets better the bigger you make it effectively. Anybody else? Ooh, uh, one more. One more. I know it's like a, an in-depth topic, but for example, um, the example you had before with two rooms, what's the failure scenario of losing those two rooms, losing a connection? Um, the, okay, if you've got two separate rooms and your cluster split across them, what's the failure scenario of them losing a connection? Um, you always have an odd number of mons um, so that they have quorum. So one of your two rooms is probably going to have two mons in it and the other one's going to have one or, or three and two or whatever. So um, whichever one ends up with a quorum of mons is going to be the, the living one, if you like. Um, and um, thank you for that. I'd like to apologize again for the video problems. They looked really good on my screen, but I realize that that's completely unhelpful for you people. So thanks. <laughs>